A funny thing happened to me uh, on my way to running for mayor in 1982. And that is that you all will recall that at that time, the Denver Regional Council of Governments was doing a study of a number of sites around the metro area about where to build the airport. And the day I was sworn in, July 1 of 1983, Dr. Cog had its first meeting about three weeks later. And at that, it was my first meeting that I attended and it announced that it had picked the final site and it was expanding the airport onto the Rocky Mountain Arsenal which as a candidate for mayor, I supported. <laughs> I, I said, that's the best, that's the best location. You know? and, and so we went into Dr. Cog, and, and they voted two to one in favor of expanding onto the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And the one group that voted against it was the Adams County delegation. And so the mayors of Commerce City and Bright and the Adams County commissioners were sitting across the table from me, and they were very upset. And they looked at me and they said, you will never build this airport on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And I walked away and I think I talked to Tom and Steve and others and I said, what was all that about? And that's when uh, a decision was made that I should go and talk to them. And so I, I went and met with the, the two mayors and the three mm -hmm. Adams County commissioners at Bubba's restaurant mm -hmm. in Adams County. And I think, Mayor, it was the first time a mayor of Denver had gone to Adams County to, Adams County to meet with them on their turf. And we had a couple of beers and a big old steak. That's when I could eat meat. Yeah. Uh, and basically I said, what's the problem? And they said, we are concerned about noise on the two cities. And God forbid if a plane would crash, we're concerned about safety. And I said, all right, what would you like us to do? And they said, we'll move it. And I said, well, we just voted to build it on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. If we move it, we've got to make sure that it's on Denver land. And that's what kind of started the the complex negotiations that, that followed. Dinner at Bubba's. How long did it take, How? Federico, for you to get the other members of council and others into the discussion mix about, because I always thought this was a bold decision on your administration's part to actually say, <clears throat> we're going to shut one airport down and move another one to another site. And also the location, because if I remember a lot of the press clips at that time, <laughs> were about moving the airport south mm -hmm. towards, towards El Paso County because there was so much development going on. Right. And I always <laughs> thought that the part of the decision you made that was the most, one of the most brilliant was actually moving it north where there was so little economic activity going on at the time. Well, it, it was an effort uh, because yeah. first of all, council members, I don't think knew I was going to Adams <laughs> County to have this discussion. So we went to Adams County and, and I came back and started a, obviously briefed the team and then we had a preliminary discussions with the council to bring them into the conversation to see how they felt about it. And of course there were lots of questions. You know, why are we gonna move it and who's gonna own the land and how do we do it and how do we annex land with the Poundstone Amendment constrictions? And, and there were some business people who said, no, build it south and we said no. Um, you know, there's El Paso and the airport down there, we needed something up north, and so we had the conversation with the city council, and after that, we then launched into, for better or worse, confidential negotiations with Adams County, and I think all the council members were there. Just about no. all the, or, or a delegation so of the council members. Yeah. Yes. And I know all the lawyers were there. No. <laughs> all the lawyers no. were there. No, right? we, were, we were talking about it earlier. It was uh, me and Bill Roberts okay. and Dave Doring That's and right. Tom. Yeah. Um, and Skip Spensley. Yes. And, and of course, the lawyers from Adams County and the Adams County delegation. And, and uh, we were holed up for I don't know how long, how many Co days? A couple days. At oh, the yeah. Months and months. Yeah. 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 The, the two things I think people forget, though, I mean, one is um, independent of what Adams County's viewpoint was, when we actually got to spend time on what the Rocky Mountain Arsenal answer looked like, we became independently convinced it was a pipe dream that could never be built. It would be the worst airport ever because. You know, the runway placements, I mean, it was too small. You know, they were trying to avoid areas of contamination. They were trying to keep the terminal in Denver. It was, it would have worse noise problems and horrible efficiency issues and just, it was, and it probably couldn't be done. And so we realized that all this regional momentum had been built up around an answer that wasn't an answer. And the only alternative was to go to Bennett, which wasn't really an answer. And so there was no answer. And I think we walked in the door assuming, well, these people have been spending a lot of time in this. They know the answer. They didn't know the answer. And I think that, you know, and then part two, the, the 84 MOU, which was really the beginnings of the idea of a replacement airport, 
it was a much smaller airport, much closer to Denver, that really did overlap, in fact, would be transitioned through the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. What we ended up with was an entirely different looking facility, much bigger, much farther away. And there were two other issues I remember, Steve, you worked on this. First was the noise. Right. I mean, we were being sued yeah, I mean, by the, people you, in Park Hill and in Aurora. You, you really can't forget, mm -hmm. in the early 80s, how bad the noise was in yeah. Park Hill. And I mean, these wonderful residential neighborhoods, all the way from Park Hill, um, all through Northeast Denver, mm -hmm. it was really terrible. Right. And, and so, and that was an issue in the 83 right. campaign, right. right? too. And so we were sued, and, and then secondly, we, we learned that it was going to cost billions of dollars to clean up the Rocky Mountain North. And it was probably going to take 10 years, 15 years, and we said by the time we do that, we could have gone to the Supreme Court and back right. in litigation. So for all those reasons, we finally said, you're right, Tom, independently, right. this site isn't really going to work. It made it easier to negotiate because, in fact, Adams County didn't realize that we had already lost all faith in that solution. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, that was truthfully, that's what made it easy to think about something else. We had to think about something else. That, that wasn't it. All right. All right. I mean, there, what some people forget is the, the arsenal is in Adams County. Yeah. And Adams County, there's a state law that lets counties have permitting authority over activities of statewide interest, including airports. So that was the leverage they had. It wasn't just they said, we're not going to let you build your airport. It was, you're not going to build it in our county unless we let you. And you said, all, everybody said, we're happy to build it in your county as long as it becomes our county. Exactly. Later, there would be a vote in Adams County. There had to be, but but there was also a vote in Denver County, and that didn't have to happen. So maybe you could talk about why you took it to the citizens of Denver. <laughs> well, there was there was an interesting, uh, I can't believe, political controversy about the decision. Uh, but first of all, when when it was announced we were going to move it, you had the hotels by Old Stapleton yes. who were right. very upset, right. and a lot of business people who'd made investments around the area who thought they were all going to go bankrupt. So you had that issue. And then, of course, you had Denver residents that said, well, we enjoy driving seven and a half miles to the current airport. Why do we have to drive you know, to Kansas now? Uh, so we had to deal with that. Uh, but once we did that, then it was, number one, clear that we had to have a, an election in Adams County. And, and that's where really everybody came together. We had the Chamber of Commerce right. and labor and right. neighborhood activists right. and, environment, and you know, environmental groups who right. were con concerned yeah. that yeah. we had satisfied their issues and they all campaigned. Governor Romer was very much involved with this oatmeal circuit, circuit. remember that? Yeah. <laughs> so Adams County voted uh, two to one. Right, but there was a Denver vote before the Adams before County. Before that. No, no, it was no, after. after. It was after, after. pardon me, after. Yeah. Denver was after. So, so what happened was, so once that happened, uh, uh, a few members of city council, <laughs> won't mention them, yeah. said, wait a minute. We have Adams County voted, why don't we vote? And I said, we don't have to vote because there's no taxes being imposed. But I said, well, if you want to have a vote in Denver, let's have it. And uh, That's right. I you think they were surprised. You forgot, you've forgotten Dick Young. Remember the Dick Young's group? I mean, there were, That's right. I mean, in some ways, the Denver election was about being able to finance the airport because post Adams County vote uh, and the EIS being completed, we thought, great, you know, we're on a path where we can actually do this. And I remember being at Bruce Rockwell's house, and he said, you know, I had breakfast, and somebody told me Dick Young says he's going to put this on the ballot in Denver. And I, and I, I sort of scoffed. I said, like, well, what, you know, what, well, but, you know, but we couldn't really move forward with financing with this prospect that people were going to collect signatures to put the issue on the ballot in Denver. And everybody went through this turmoil, but what, what, are we, what are we going to do about that? And I think we decided that the only answer was we should put it on the ballot, control the timing of that event, manage that, and, and get on with it, because we didn't have the luxury of letting them go out and spend time trying to get signatures and all the uncertainty. And, and I think we went from, the Adams County vote was in uh, November? November to May, I think. And, we, and we were back on the morning. Denver ballot yeah. in the spring, right? In, in uh, or spring or summer. Yeah, but yeah. I think that was a really a great, thoughtful um, decision that we all made to, because it gave us an opportunity to take the project out to the neighborhoods and to show right. it to them and talk to them about what we were doing right. and answer their questions and really start feeling their support and really explain how the financing was going right. to work. Right. Even though it wasn't a vote that was needed to <laughs> finance the airport, right. it, it, they needed to understand because we were talking about so much money. Right. Well, it was, it was a reaffirmation mm -hmm. right. that it 
was the right decision, right. <clears throat> that the public themselves had an opportunity to get involved and said, I helped make this decision. Right, right. And the two, and I think the other one was Chenoweth, wasn't he? Yep. With, yep. with uh, Dick Young, yeah. you had the loyal yeah. opposition. Yeah. But it uh, really, and I think that's why so many people said, I had a part in building the airport because right. they had a chance to vote on the airport. <laughs> right. It was sort of right. Airport 101. We right. Had, right. We first had to explain how Stapleton worked. Right. Because people had forgotten <laughs> exactly. how Stapleton worked. Right. And they exactly. forgot about the 35,000 jobs, direct jobs and indirect jobs. And then they once understood that, then we said we're going to do the same thing but bigger at the new airport. And once people That's right. got the economics of the airport and that taxes weren't going to be increased, then they felt very good about it. So once those two elections happened, then we had to negotiate with the airlines. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, and I remember... Uh, I think you were. In the, you all were at the meeting. We, United Airlines came in and uh, they said they were first committed to the new airport, and but they wanted extensions at Stapleton, so we allowed them to have right. to build another concourse. Well, the lease, their lease was up in 1993. Yeah. So we gave them uh, a little more breathing room, and we said, right. well, we'll let you continue to improve uh, Stapleton, but you've got to support the new airport. But a funny thing happened <laughs> on the way to that uh, journey. Because at the very last minute, they came in and said, you know, we've changed our mind. Uh, we're not going to support the new airport. Right. It's really not needed. We love all the improvements you've made at Stapleton. <laughs> and uh, I remember they came in, and um, we, I had their contract. Steve had drafted it. And um, I, I, it was a one- or two-year extension, and I got it, and I threw it in a trash can uh, in front of them. And I said, you're now month to month at Stapleton. And the day I tell you you got to move, you got to move. And they got very upset, and they left. But I said, you have to understand something. This is not your airport. This is the airport of the people of Denver. And once they understood that and we were serious, then Continental called, Frank Lorenzo right. called and said, I want to support the airport. And they wanted to outdo United. <laughs> so we said, right. great, Frank. I think you left out two years in there, though. Yeah, yeah. 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 Continental. Well, you know, one of, a couple United of the were. things that we did that I think were just really so beneficial <laughs> to bringing together the business community and the whole, you know, the, the political establishment was when we took those trips. Those, yeah. To, right, right. We went to Dallas, Dallas and we went to Atlanta yeah, and yeah. we spent a day, we right. had we had plane full of people, 250 <clears throat> people probably, and we met sort of like this with all the people that had been involved in the politics and the building of uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport and then Atlanta. And that was really fantastic because they held up, I'll never forget it said this is what they will do to you when you build this right. airport right. they will you know call you bums and they will call you every name that you can and they will try to divide you as an elective body right. they will try to divide the council from the mayor and all that and we were like we can handle it <laughs> so so anyway when all this started happening we were like wow that's exactly what they told us right. was going to happen right. so that was i thought that was really a fantastic idea yeah, it was very helpful. What happened in those two years? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I obviously missed something very important. Well, this is—I mean, my consolidated history of all that. You know, I, I think the airlines always understood that what they really wanted was one more runway for Stapleton. They really had no interest in a new facility because it created all kinds of issues for them. It, it cost issues, but also competitive issues. Denver was a constrained, capacity-constrained place, but there was no room for any competitors to join that. You know, I mean, American came and wanted to build a hub. There was, we, we told them we couldn't do it. So I think they were fine with that. And, and in 85 and, and beyond, when we started getting serious about really creating a replacement airport with essentially unconstrained capacity, they became much more vocal and active and really moved into the opposition mode. And I think they always believed that we couldn't do it without them. You know, they didn't believe you could finance an airport without airline commitments. They didn't believe we could get through the federal government. Uh, you know, they just didn't believe any of that could happen. So that I think they felt pretty confident they could control this. Uh, and in 87, um, we finally told them, we're moving on with or without you. We're going to plan the best airport in the world. You can help. You don't sit on the sidelines, do what you want, but, but we're moving on. And I really think at that point, they did kind of step back even out of the planning. I mean, on a technical level, their people stayed quietly involved to make sure that if it ever did happen, that they were comfortable with what we were doing. But as a practical matter, they were really um, pretty much opponents for, for an extended period of time. And it was only after federal funding commitments and the EIS completion and showing them that, in fact, the marketplace in deregulation didn't need airline leases to, to finance an airport, even a hubbing airport, um, they all started to realize that maybe they had underestimated you know, how far we could get. And then the litigation about whether we could use the money we had to advance the project, I think they thought the courts would prevent us from spending money on this, but they, they didn't. Uh, 
Because if they had really known all that was going to happen, I think they had all the tools to prevent this from ever occurring. Yeah, I, that's one of the great ironies or mysteries, which is they fought it, but they didn't fight it as hard as they could have. And I don't know if they didn't because they thought we just couldn't get there, like you said, or they really didn't want to go all out. But, but the fighting, for me, one of the great moments was we were... We needed to issue $750 million worth of bonds. First financing. We had no airline agreements, none. Goldman Sachs comes in and says, we believe in this airport. We will buy the bonds. We will buy the bonds. And we will guarantee that you will be able to do this financing. Continental had filed for bankruptcy in May. Um, I mean, so, you know, United was there, but... Um, the ability to do the first financing finally after all that and what was then, I mean, that's still a big number today, but that was one of the biggest airports. Also the fact that we went ahead and done. bought the site. I think, right. you know, I think even, well, we, even, right. even if we'd never gotten any farther, I think what we were doing was leaving the region an option because right. when we had looked at all the possible solutions, you can't go west because the mountains, you can't really go south because the topography and the pattern of development down there, you'll be out in Timbuktu. And only the, you know, the arsenal... Um, had, you know, had really driven the pattern of development in Northeast around, you know, so there was land actually. I mean, where do you find 50 square miles where you hardly relocate a house in that kind of proximity to a metropolitan area? You know, so I think we felt like if, if we could buy a site and annex it, even if we got nothing else done, the future would have some options and then we'd go from there. I don't know if we ever thought we'd get all the way there to actually starting construction because I think we thought the airlines would be resourceful enough, they would find ways to make it hard and for us to And then there was some mayor who said, we're going to do this in five years. I forgot his name. And, <laughs> and, um, five seemed like a reasonable number. It was number. a good number, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it was a good number, yeah. you know? um, So that well, kind of... Those are all goals. <laughs> those <laughs> but, are cheap, but, you know, you know, goals, change, change, stretch goals. goals. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you, right. so do you guys remember the day that we went to market? Yes, I, day I, it was? I do remember oh, it specifically what, because, because not only were the bonds sold, they were sold and they were over sold. There was right. over demand yes. for them. We had to pay a little over 10% interest, a little high interest at the time, but it was the first yeah. time bonds had been sold without airline right. agreements and it completely shocked the world. But also, but what was the day? January 15th, 1991. It was the morning when we get we got into the office um, in Goldman Sachs and the president comes on and they announced that we're going to go to war. Yeah. And I called okay. Federico and said, uh, <laughs> what, what, <laughs> now what are we doing? Now what are we doing? <laughs> and yeah. so we waited a little while. We delayed the right. sale a little bit and then we sold everything. Right. But it was. I think it was, uh, was it 91 or 90? Well, well, anyway, somewhere yeah. 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 and, and, and then we had to get the, the, the $500 million from the federal government. Right. And of course, nobody believed we could do that. But thanks to Sam Skinner. Sam, right. I was going to say yeah. that. Sam yeah. Skinner yeah. and President Bush, yeah. who both said, you right. know, this is not a Democratic or Republican right. Right. airport. It's a, an airport that's congesting the national transportation right. system. If we can eliminate one right. clog, it's worth the financial investment mm -hmm. of the federal government. So I, I, I was audited at the time, and I remember you coming yeah. back, getting off the plane with a big check. That, yes. uh, right. that uh, really calmed down, and this was the federal money, because it calmed down all the financial markets in terms of yeah. there's actually real money in this deal, right. and it's going to happen. But, you know, going back to one point, when Stephanie talked about the trips to Dallas-Fort Worth and also to Atlanta, the other story out of that is that the cities that made wrong decisions on airports and airlines, if you remember, Delta was actually going to locate in Birmingham. Mm. And Birmingham did not want them, and so Bur so Delta moved to Atlanta, yeah. and it changed the whole construct well, of that right. city altogether. And uh, and I remember those conversations, Federico, when you were leading to conversations about all of the development that took place around Dallas Fort Worth, what was going on, even with just the building of the airport that it uh, that it sprung mm -hmm. up and created another central core of downtown. Exactly. Yeah. And you were the auditor, the right. second year that the second auditor right. after I was elected, but you had to sign all those documents right, and review right. all those documents, <laughs> make sure we were doing them correctly, yeah, right? Right, right? Because all those folks out there were saying we were going to bankrupt the city. That's remember? exactly right. We were going to put in debt our grandchildren for 200 years. And yeah. you said, no, they're, they're fine, and you signed them all. And <laughs> we moved on. So, um, And that's when the big contracts started coming in. Yes. Remember those? Yep. 
Yep. And we had just passed that charter amendment in, what, 83, that said that anything over half a million dollars right. the city council had to vote on. Yep. And we were looking at these 10 million, 50 million, 80 million, and the, you know, we had a lot of meetings that went on till yeah. two or three or four in the morning. Well, do you remember the, the public hearing the ultimate uh, Donnybrook when we had, I think it's still a standing record for public hearings. It went on for two nights. I think it was 13 and a half hours uh, on the airport. Uh, and, and I can't even remember the exact moment where we were in the process, but this was, it was probably prior to the Denver election. Um, I mean, it, it, I've been to a lot of painful city council hearings, but that was, it, it just went on forever. And it was about everything under the sun. And, uh, and even the airlines showed up, although Sam Ashmore spoke for Continental and was very, dignified in expressing their reluctance, but, uh, uh, but man, what a painful night, or nights. 89? But, but, was... but at the end of the day, most members of the council supported it. Yeah. Yeah. Most That's citizens right. supported it. Right. The right. business community was obviously right. all on board. We right. had the Adams County commissioners and mayors who campaigned for it. Right. And by the way, I, I want to say something about them. They were extremely courageous, because most of them were defeated when they were up for re-election. Yeah. Uh, even though even though they passed the they worked hard for it, vote. they passed the annexation, right. and of course today Adams County has benefited extraordinarily from the airport. But I, I, those are heroes in my mind. And I, I've run into Dave Rose every yep. once in a while, and I congratulate him, thank him for his yeah. courage. But they had they were able to see the vision, and, and they were able to think long term and, and recognize this was bigger than any one city or any one community. And thanks to them um, and the city council you know, and, right? and, and yeah. Otter. he was the founder of the committee against Stapleton expansion, and it staked his whole political career on there not being an expanded Denver Airport, and then ultimately became the best advocate for. DIA. Um, right. You know, the other piece of this that we ought to talk about, because we have to shift over to, to Wellington's administration, is that we, we wanted to build an airport that wasn't going to have the same constraints and the same problems as the old Stapleton. Right. So we said, if we're going to build something, let's build it for the next hundred years. So let's have enough land. You know, and at the end of the day, we can now build 12 runways on the airport. And I remember when I went to Japan, uh, and they were building this island to build their airport off of Narita, I think it was. And I was trying to explain that this was 50 square right. miles of land. And they were doing the calculations in kilometers and meters. And <laughs> they finally said, that can't be, that can't be the case. You're, you're building a country. Right. Because we're just building this little island for, you know, $20 billion for one runway. Which, you know, and, and, and finally, when they understood the magnitude of this, they said, you guys are really thinking about the next century. We said, yes, because we want to be able to not have the same noise problems with right. residential areas. We don't want to have constraints. If we want to have, you know, six concourses or seven concourses or 12 runways, we ought to build this for the next generation. And thankfully, everybody bought into that. Most people bought into that and they, well, they and saw the vision. That's, remember when um, we met El Ray Jefferson? That's right. That right. he, he and his supporters came forward when we learned his fantastic story. And I just remember that we were out um, at one of the groundbreakings, and he came out, and he just extemporaneously told the press why it was so fantastic to build that airport. It was great. And um, you know, he was just a—he's just a, a wonderful person to have be part of the legacy yes. of it. Speaking of great people who are no longer with us, you mentioned Mr. Jepson. What about Bill Smith? Yeah, Bill was at Public Works. He was the engineer. I mean, and Bill was terrific because Bill had. You know, he's an engineer, so he was mostly concerned about cost, functionality, and so we would talk to him about aesthetics. Right. <laughs> He'd go, uh, and uh, but but very thoughtfully, you know. But but at the end of the day, what, the, what was so great about Bill was that he was loyal, loyal to the city, loyal to his job, and and loyal to the leadership of the city. And at the end of the day, when you said, Bill, we really want to make this a beautiful facility, not just a functional facility. And yeah, we want that interesting roof. You know, even though you never really have seen something like that, and it's going to work, and we want art built into it. He sat there and said, yes, sir. And he went out and did it, you know, most, most of the time. And the other person we haven't talked about is George Dowdy. Right, because right. what George had to do was not only run the old airport, but simultaneously oversee right. the new airport construction team, building a new airport, and then, remember, overnight... Yeah. Under your administration, yeah, I was going to ask closing you to talk and open. about. We better talk about that. What that it was well, like. When well, the, the other piece that was <clears throat> that was interesting is that uh, when we were coming in, all the press was asking, "Who are you going to get to be uh, manager of public works? Who are you going to get to be aviation director? And aren't you going to bring in new people?" And I said, "Well, this doesn't make any sense." 
you want to keep the people that are there that have been involved in the project. So we kept George as mm -hmm. the aviation director. And I remember uh, to this day when I was in interviewing Bill, and I said, well, you know, we're going to need you as manager of public works, and, uh, and you can continue the construction of the airport. And is there anything you want to tell me before I make a determination about you being the uh, public works director? And he said, well, you know, I've uh, been public director, works director a long time, and, you know, I work for Bill McNichols. And there was an occasion that I had one chore I didn't do well, and that was remove snow back in 83. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, Bill, we're not going to hold you that against you. Everybody has one issue that they didn't do well. So so long as you do the airport, we're in good shape. <laughs> well, you know what? One of the things that maybe is only interesting to us was the structure at the time. Public Works was the man it was in the charter manager of aviation. Stapleton was a little speck in that yeah, in that structural organization chart. And as as the new airport started growing and the it, it started uh, you know, it started sort of overtaking public works right. in, yeah. in terms of the building. Well, after I came in, the one the one of the biggest issues was United Airlines. And so some of this has been instructive to me because I wish you had been able to get them to sign. <laughs> we tried. So when I came in, one of the first things we did was uh, I placed calls to, uh, to uh, Stephen Wolf, and um, he didn't return the call initially, and I left a message on the phone that won't go on this tape. But um, <laughs> then I later called him, and he returned the call, and he said, um, uh, congratulations on being elected mayor. And I said, well, all oh, that's nice, but let's get to the contract. Uh, we need a contract. And he said that, um, well, he would send someone out in a few months to talk about the contract. And so I asked him, where was he going to land his aircraft? Because Denver owns this airport. And he said, uh, well, we're going to land him at Stapleton. I said, no, I think you're going to land him in Colorado Springs. <laughs> and he said, then there was this pause, and he said, well, you can't do that. And I said, I'm so new, I don't know what I can't do yet. <laughs> so, so I think I would suggest you come out as quickly as possible. So he came out four days later with his, with his attorney. Yeah. And, uh, and then we started, uh, we started negotiating the contract. Which, uh, and I remember Bill Smith calling me from Chicago. He came out, we agreed to do the contract. Then Bill and Dan Muse flew back to uh, their headquarters in Chicago. And he said, oh, yeah. Bill called and said, you know, they've agreed to sign this contract, but there's one piece of this I got to tell you I'm uncomfortable with. A damn baggage system. But this is the only way they'll sign the contract. So obviously going on optimism and faith, I said, well, Bill, we need their, we need their signature on the dotted line. We'll work, we'll work on the baggage system later. <laughs> and, and they were upset that our administration had given Continental Concourse A. Oh, they were, they were livid. Well, they, well, they, well, didn't, yeah. they didn't sign. Well, I, well, I said to them, you guys sign up first, right, you yeah. get to pick the Concourse. They, they had a choice. Yeah, they had they, a choice. I mean, because I, I remember this because the three, Tom and Mayor and I were there. They said, we don't care. There's nothing Continental can do right. to compete with us. We, it yeah, doesn't we felt obligated. Matter. We actually were about to make an agreement with Continental, right. which was going to put them on the first concourse and, right. and reconfigure the international rivals and all that. And we, and we called Larry Nagin, the general counsel, and said, we can't tell you what's happening. We're just telling you that if you were ever serious about coming down and finally resolving this, you ought to come down tomorrow. Um, and Larry said, there's nothing you could do with Continental that would really affect us. And then the next day I was in Steve Wolf's office because it's like, oh my God, I can't believe you did that with Continental. You know, you have to change this. And we said, well. Well, it got worse <laughs> because then everybody decided to build the walking bridge, yeah. mm -hmm. which they really opposed also. Right. And it was like, you're going to build a, a walking bridge? <laughs> Wait a minute. I mean, so it's just, it's... So we gave you that quarter to quarter. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, we had to give you some problem to deal with, you know? Well, that was the first change order. Uh, once we agreed to do the, uh, to, to do the baggage system, that uh, it was a $65 million change order to expand the terminal in order to accommodate the baggage system on their design, which uh, I always refer to it as a United Airlines baggage system. Okay. Well, it's funny. They went from no, 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 to jumped in with both feet and wanted you know this gigantic hub, and then got totally freaked out about whether they could operate it and do all the things at that scale, and that, that made them worry about everything, the baggage system and and everything else. And I think it drove them into a 
you know, a set of desires that history hasn't sort of validated. You know, they actually would have been just fine with everything. They were better off on Concourse B than on A. Um, it all would have been just fine. And you probably remember too that when the airport did open, there were what, like 50 or 60 pending gate requests to move, uh, if, if anything, freed up on A because people didn't think they could operate on C. And like the day, you know, a week after that, they all went away because everybody said, oh, never mind, it's fine, you know, doesn't matter. Mir, what, can you talk a little bit about what it was like to shut down the airport? Yeah. I was in Washington, the Secretary of Transportation at the time. Right. But to so, shut down Stapleton, move, it was a 24 hour right. midnight march, right. as I recall. Right. And, and people said it couldn't be done, and it wasn't going. How, how did and, you and, talk and about And Stephanie it? was involved in the middle of that. And I, I tell you, I felt like General George Patton because <laughs> I went out. <clears throat> because I, I was in amazement at all the city employees and airline employees yeah. moving all of this equipment <clears throat> from one airport to the other. And the last yeah. flight that came in, and the flight attendants were saying, well, what's this, this is the last flight in the, in, into Stapleton. And we moved all of that overnight, and then you're always wondering the next day, is it going to work? Right. <laughs> right. Is it going to work? Is you know, it was like a work? parade. It was 11 miles long. Right. Yeah. Went on for 24 hours, right. and it was every possible kind of equipment that you could ever think of. And then mm -hmm. remember, we had the issue of the people who had flown out of Denver when it was Stapleton, and the people who were flying oh, in right. to DIA right. now, and then getting them back to their cars and getting them back to Stapleton, right. Right. and having them not be familiar with the new facility. Well, and then. After we moved it, moved, and we were getting ready to open the airport, uh, I spent the night at the fire station, and then it began to snow. And I, if you remember, because you were coming yeah. in as Secretary of Transportation, yeah. and then I was asking myself, "God, don't do this to me." <laughs> you know, now we're going to have snow, and then it hit me. This is ideal because this is why the airport was, was built, built. Exactly. because we will be able to land three aircraft simultaneously at the right. same time, two right. united and one continental, and it came off without a hitch. And as I recall, there was some posturing about which airline would land right. first, right? right. right. And you, you had to right. make that right. decision right. in letting somebody right. land first so they could take credit. But well, talking about opening day, maybe the, the opening days that didn't happen. <clears throat> um, <laughs> The, um, no, I don't thinking, want to talk about the opening <laughs> <laughs> I don't either, but uh, thinking of, uh, in particular, the decision after being told you had to have an opening date, and then we don't open in May of, of uh, 1994, and you decide not to set another opening date until we do an analysis and, and, move, and, and you get the, the information back and then you deliberate. How tough a decision was that, and how much pressure were you getting to name a fifth date without that? Well, I, well, I knew how this deal works. If it, if it works, everyone claims credit. If it doesn't work, only one person gets the heat and takes the blame. <laughs> right. So that part, um, but, but you know, the piece that um, I think was critically important, and I'm going to ask Stephanie to talk about this because it's one of my favorite DIA stories. When we decided to build a new baggage system, in addition to the United baggage system, United wanted to sign off on everything that took place. Mm -hmm. So we had a meeting and some of the business, we brought some of the business community in because we wanted them to see how the process worked because they were not accustomed to making decisions with the press in the room. They were very uncomfortable and they didn't want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. But we said we we're going to do the decision anyway. So we brought an engineer out of the air, from the airport, Spinelli, and he started diagramming this uh, new baggage system. Well, his that we were theory building. was that we could use the existing tug and cart system through the tunnels that were there and we could get the airport open without building this huge big backup backup system. Um, and at that point the airlines kind of looked at each other and, and they just could not imagine the chaos of doing, having a manual backup system. But what we had done in preparation for that discussion was uh, we had gone to Atlanta and we had gone with the facilities um, folks and we had spent two days with them and watched how they delivered baggage and how it because theirs is all on the surface and how they were able to service and move the luggage around so we felt that we had a really good case for making that system work to get the airport open because we, you know, we were at a point where we were starting to run low on money and we needed them, we needed them to come forward and help us solve this problem. And United also had then begun taking a position telling us privately that they were supportive of delaying the airport opening ah. until some future date and they didn't care if it opened 
uh, immediately. Now the part, because Stephanie didn't give you all the drama to it. <laughs> we have this engineer, Frederick, who comes out of, out of the airport, and he starts, Tom, drawing this design on the green board. And uh, it sounded so authentic and nutty at the same time, I called a recess to the meeting. And I pulled Stephanie out and I said, is this real? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, the guy is making it up as he goes. But because the United people didn't know that it was being made up as he goes, they said, if they're crazy enough to try to implement that, we're better off signing with a traditional design, um, which is what they ended up doing. <laughs> well, you know what's remarkable about, about all, all these big projects is almost every major airport has had issues. Right. Dallas Fort Worth opened with doors that didn't open, and they had all kinds of issues. And other airports have built, uh, other cities have built airports that had cost overruns, all kinds of issues. But what's remarkable about this is notwithstanding all of that experience, and it was, it was tough, today, all the people who predicted that the, that the airport would not make money, right. that we'd lose money on the bonds, right. that the city would go broke, that the airport wouldn't work, that the airlines wouldn't use it, all that stuff. You know, we look back, and today we can laugh about it. Right. At least I can right. laugh about it and say it was worth it all. It was worth all the pain and suffering and, well, the, right. and the challenge. I do, I do want to come back to um, Bill Smith because I think that uh, he epitomized what a great yeah. city public employee is. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that he worked so hard on the airport, he knew because he knew the construction business so well, he knew the contractors when they were trying to fudge on bids because he had it all in his head. And, and I've always believed to this day that he put so much of himself in the airport without any sleep and rest right. that when he developed that brain tumor mm. is that uh, it was all airport related because right. that was all, all he was doing. And, um, mm -hmm. and then after that, that was also cause for one of the delays because we had lost the aviation director, we had lost the construction manager, right. and uh, now we were, because Ginger was about number two or three down, yeah. and so now we were pr promoting people in the ranks right. to levels in the airport to manage that had never been at that level before. Right. Yeah. Ginger did a great job. Yeah, though. she really stepped up. My favorite, Bill Smith. I love Bill, and he was an amazing character. We were interviewing uh, architects for various roles, and you know we had a whole variety of people. But Helmut Jan was one of the people we were going to interview, and uh, we didn't necessarily think we would likely hire him. But so there's Bill with his you know flat top haircut and you know, his pens in his pocket, you know, short sleeve shirt, you know, and Helmut Jan comes in with his uh, fedora and his cape. Uh, <laughs> I was just watching Bill. I just wanted to see what kind of. <laughs> I could just think. I could just see him praying. Please don't hire this guy. Please don't hire this guy. Mayor Webb, did you did you ever regret not getting the Buffalo down for DIA? No. Um, I remember Bill wasn't very excited about it. He was a good trooper. I, I, I always had this dream. At, uh, the staff used to hate for me to take trips because I'd always come back with a new idea. And uh, and I always thought, for a business person from the east coming in, coming down Pena Boulevard and looking to the west and seeing the sunset, the mountains, yeah. and uh, having bison out there roaming great. around, I said, if they can't close a deal, they don't deserve one. <laughs> Except the staff, the FAA, no one else thought it was a good idea because buffalo and bison have a habit of, of running through fences and gates that right. uh, might end up uh, taking out an aircraft as it was about to take off. So. It was a great idea whose time has not come. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one of the things we haven't talked about were the concessions and really right. how forward thinking and good for the community, the idea that, that uh, the mayor put forward, which was we should share this with the community mm -hmm. and right. with small businesses. And, right. and um, that really gave us, that was a lot of hard work to put that plan together, but I think we have made a lot of people in this community very happy with the opportunity that they got to be part of that. Absolutely, and yeah. because of the, the airport engineers didn't want to break down the contracts. Right, so we want right, to give a, right, a hundred right. million dollar contract to some international company, and I think at, at Old Stapleton we started to break the molds. Right. And no, no, break the contracts down, and let local people compete, and let local artists right. help yeah. participate in the airport. Right. Not just bring in some artists from Paris, 
but we have great artists here in Colorado who can contribute, and they and, did. And, and the view was that they did not have the financial capacity right. Right. to compete, and, and our view was that in America they ought to have the same right to go bankrupt or become a millionaire like right. anyone else. Right. So some of them are going to be successful, some of them aren't. But what uh, the benefit is going to be, it adds another layer of individuals that are minorities and, and women and local business people that are now owners of spaces in the airport, uh, financed by local mm -hmm. Colorado banks, mm -hmm. and all that money mm -hmm. turns over in the local economy, which it's a win-win for everyone. So it's another group that's, when they talk about Denver National Airport, they also say, this is where I do business, this is where I go. It's a, uh, they also have bought into that system. You know, one thing that we, we haven't talked about is the old Stapleton. Right. And, and, and remember when we first started talking about the airport, right. we, we kept saying, the new airport's going to be great, it's going to have all that activity and new aviation, but by the way, we're going to be able to rebuild seven and a half square miles of land, right. which is part of Denver, it's going to yep. be a whole new community, and people kind of blank that out. Right. And as you know, uh, years later, now it's got thousands of homes and schools, right. and it's a great area to live, and it's added to the vitality and the economic yeah. strength of the city and the diversity it's of the economic base. kept young families in Denver. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was kind of a funny conversation that we had. Remember that? Because we were starting to feel good, like the airport was going to open. And I said to Wellington one day, you know what, this is never going to let up. And he said, what? And I said, they're not going to say, hey, good job opening the airport. <laughs> what about Stapleton? Remember that? <laughs> so in the middle of, of the last year of all that planning and all that building, we were putting together the groups and the business community right. and all the planners yeah. and everything to go forward and have a really what I think is a fantastic plan for, for Stapleton. Right. And Tom, didn't you, was Sam Gary kind of help mm -hmm. fund yeah. the... Yeah, I was working Tom? for the Stapleton and Redevelopment. I, I, foundation for those six years and I uh, the last thing I wanted to do was have anything more to do with the city or the airport after my eight years and <laughs> and uh, and they approached me and I said you know it's a great idea but not for me and uh, but they persuaded me and, and it turned out to be actually a lot of fun and um, but yeah Stapleton's you know it's funny I remember when we were trying to explain to the city council why it didn't matter that the airlines weren't supporting the airport, how we could still build it. And, and of course, we didn't really know the answer to that. We were just, we were just a premise <laughs> that this sort of like something we could do. Engineer. We had a, a you know, sheet of white paper, and you know, it's sort of like, here's the money we have, you know, and here's the money we get, and here's what we think we can finance with revenue bonds, and here's Stapleton. I'm right. sure that's worth something, right. you know, and we were just trying to piece it all together. But really, nobody had much time to, you know, to focus a lot on Stapleton at that point. It was just hard to make that the priority, even though it obviously mattered. But I. I do think in the end, with all the ups and downs and twists and turns, Stapleton became, I mean, you think about the, the addition to the open space system, which you had a lot right, to do with, right. and, um, you know, the, the number of young families um, seeking out schools at Stapleton, and, you know, I mean, it's just uh, 10,000 people, most of them young families with kids. Uh, in fact, it's created a boom in the DPS system, you know, but, um, but that's remarkable. And I mean, you think about that as a ancillary achievement. You know, we we certainly weren't struggling with too many good schools and too many great parks and too many young middle class families with their kids wanting to live in Denver. That's not what was happening in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Well, we had no place to grow, and right. so I mean, we had all of a sudden we had Stapleton, Lowry, and the Central Platte Valley, and it was just remarkable. I mean, we added 50,000. I don't know how many thousand people we've added. Yeah population-wise, and it was the first time you had new homes being built in, in a big way, new schools, and it's made a huge difference. And Stapleton's not even halfway done. Right. right. And, well, and to some extent, we have to thank Adams County. Yeah. Because they demanded that we not use it for aviation right. purposes. Right. And they demanded we shut the airport down and not well, have two I mean, airports. We went Dallas to all and, the other places, the two things people told us, particularly Dallas-Fort Worth, um, whatever you think, you're not going to buy enough land and even though you thought you put the old airport to bed, it'll come back to life. And so we spent all our time trying to think about what's enough land and how do you keep the old airport from coming back to life. And, and we, we created 100 booby traps to try and keep Stapleton from coming back to life as a competitive facility, because that is really the most threatening thing to the airlines. Yes. You can't get anybody to move if they're not all moving. And, um, but yeah, and then settling the noise suit, all those things were, were really tools. I mean, truthfully, I think the noise issues, if, if there had been enough runway separation at Stapleton, we'd be at Stapleton. We wouldn't be here today because we would have operated that airfield, um, but but because of that, we really had no choice but to do something else. And you know, I think it gave us a chance to solve the noise issues and all those other things. But the noise issues alone would not have compelled. Don't you remember the Wall Street Journal ads <laughs> yeah. in the early '80s sure. about delays at Stapleton? Right. 
And I mean, I still remember Western Airlines Western, yeah. out of right. Salt Lake <laughs> yep. ran a full page cartoon. I still have one of those mounted, actually. You know, <laughs> and, and there was, you know, th that discussion that we were having earlier about the community buying into the new airport. Part of it was everybody knew that Stapleton wasn't working efficiently. Yeah. So be beyond the noise, people, it was a hard, got to be a hard airport. And I think people were. Well, I mean, the ready. airfield blew up in 85, 86 with about 35 million passengers. I mean, it really just came apart. Um, where are we at now? 50 some million. Um, you know, so you, you think about what Stapleton would have been asked to do or what the constraints that Denver would have lived with and all that activity would be somewhere else. It wouldn't be here. Well, right. I think if you look at uh, from 83 to 2001, what you, what 2003, what you really see is the, the, the symbolism, what Denver history is about, you know, from going to, building the train, the, the spur right. mm -hmm. to Cheyenne right. and then coming back and making sure that the train was coming to Denver and not going to Cheyenne and taking yep. the opportunity to build DIA and, yep. and also make local people involved in that. I think that um, Forest City, we just about time lost part of the Forest City deal because they got difficult on the negotiations because we were arguing for more park space. And uh, we wanted to have enough park space that it was real park space and not just the uh, just pocket, pocket parks, just right. pocket parks, right. which is we got and developers over. always want to do the parks last right. and build and build the other pieces first. I mean, you, but you you required over eleven hundred acres of parks and open space, some of which is regional, those right. big right. areas. So, but it mm -hmm. uh, but everyone that said they weren't going to use, I saw a clipping today that was big headline. I think it was in the post that uh, Jim DeLong was aviation manager there and the, 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 the aviation, the uh, head of uh, Southwest was saying, under no conditions right, will we right. ever come <laughs> right. to Denver. Right, 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 yeah. And now they want more gates, right? Right. right. <laughs> and we argued just throughout the entire time and people said, you know, landing fees are the, you know, the facility costs are the issue for the airlines. And we said, you know, in the long haul, that'll never be, you know, it's relevant, but it's not what's going to, I mean, basically if you create a quality facility that is as efficient as it can be and leave it open to see what the marketplace brings you, you'll always be better off if you can be in that position because the rest of the world is going to have other challenges and constraints. And you know, I think Southwest's presence shows that a really great facility with a volume of activity, um, you know, that they found this, you know, not only do they find it compelling, it's, it's a very large operation for them. Well, now. in our economics compared to other airports, so when the airport was built, right. landing fees were pretty high. They've actually come down significantly. Other airports that have to spend a lot more money to make improvements have gone up. And so the management of DIA has done a terrific job over the years to to make it a really competitive airport for the airlines, and it shows. Steve, the piece that, the, the piece that, that I'm taking with now because of me getting older <laughs> is that DIA has the walking sidewalks. Yeah, yes. These, all these other, other airports, right. San Francisco, yeah. even Frankfurt, Copenhagen, yeah. you can't, you don't, I don't know how some seniors, I guess they look for a wheelchair, because they right. can't walk it and there's no moving sidewalks right. in these airports. Yeah. And it's, uh, and so I think it's a lot of the little things that makes DIA so special. Yeah. And the other thing is the light rail systems are now connected right. to right. the airport. Right. We had built that in and we said someday there'll be enough economic motivation to build a light rail system to connect to the airport right. and that's now going to happen. In some ways I think that's almost the completion of this first phase, you know, that finally getting a rail connection to a real regional rail system, not just a single line, you know, I think that's, you know, the airport will really be complete when when that capability is there as well. I mean, to, when, when this airport was planned, we were competing with regional airports, Salt Lake, Dallas, we're, we're now competing with international airports, mm -hmm. with Frankfurt, DFW, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and that's kind of our, we've moved the bar now right. mm -hmm. to put Denver on an international stage, and, and it's a pretty amazing undertaking, and it's really ambitious, but that's sort of the next 10 or 15 years, I think, what's ahead. But you know, I think we should think about all the other things that had to happen. I mean, remember the FAA had to reconfigure all the, the airspace, airspace 225,000 square miles right. of airspace. I was always really taken with that, that every every plane, every airport in the region right. had was going to be rerouted. 
um, to make it to make it much more efficient and building the Tracon facility yeah. that was huge that was brand mm -hmm. new technology at the time so we were doing a lot of different pieces yeah. besides just building the airport right. but they knew as the mayors have said that the FAA knew this airport was a national priority to right. fix and so they were willing to invest mm -hmm. in it in terms of the LOI and 500 million dollars put in the technology and it's they love it and and the and the, the, the result is that now we complain about other airports right yeah <laughs> i won't mention them right yes. i don't right. want to offend those mayors but now yes. nobody complains about dia it's don't fly into that airport because the other airports are not congested and so the bad reputation we once had is now being shared or not shared it's right. now become the reputation of other and people right. now who come to the airport think it's it's beautiful, it's functional, you, you don't have the delays. The airlines like it because now they, right. they've taken advantage of the avoided delay costs right. that they used yeah, to experience so and that they're now experiencing at other airports. Right. So from a functionality perspective right. and from an investment perspective, Southwest wants to be here. Right, right. And so what do you like operate. most about the airport? What's like, when you think about DIA, what do you like, just like? What do I like yeah. the most yeah. about the airport? Just one thing. I have to narrow it to one? Well, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sort of trying yeah. to get a, you know, just I, I, a well, spot. What, I, what's your... Go ahead. Good. I, I like the roof. Yeah. The roof. It, 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 is, it is the one thing we want to do about the roof. Remember city council? Mm -hmm. Remember we had that meeting, <laughs> and, and we were looking at the flat roof, and then Kurt walks in and says, I've got another idea, and he pulls off the curtain in this roof, and I remember certain city councilmen who I won't mention said, what is that? We can right. have a Teflon roof yeah. and all that, and we said, yeah. no, we finally got most members of council to, to understand that if you had the Sydney Opera House right. making a global statement, we needed to make a statement to the world that we had a signature building, and I think the roof for right. me is right. kind of the... Well, you know, it's, it's covered here in the exhibit, too, but um, you know, even that came out of pragmatism. I mean we struggled with what's going to make the, the architecture of this dramatic and it, the terminal always had the three modules but they originally were glass and steel and and truthfully at a point to, to hold up that much glass in that location the wind loads and the size of the steel structure i mean the cost and the massive nature of the you know it was getting out of control we just couldn't figure out how to do it in a way that made any sense and you know and, and that's we were really searching for an answer to that and kurt, that's when kurt who was really coming in to document do the construction drawings essentially said jim and i have a different idea and we, you know, I mean, just trying to think about going to the city council and showing them something that looks a little bit like a circus tent and, you know, all those sort of things. And we were, you know, we thought this might be brilliant, but it might, you know, but it had a certain kind of drama to it that people were looking for. And, and then we went off, I think I went with Jim and Kurt and flew to Toronto to walk on the roof of a shopping mall that had a bird air system. And then to Vancouver, all in one continuous trip to walk on the roof of Canada Place and talk to the managers and see what the quality of light was inside. And, you know, we kind of came back and said, all right, you know, are we going to do this? You know, is this something that really makes sense? And, you know, but in the end, you, you know, something that was really a problem to be solved became, in a lot of ways, the most iconic thing about the building. And, you know, one thing yeah. we ought to recognize is the mayor who talked about this, about supporting local right. people. Right. You know, we didn't have to go to a, some international architect. Right. We had Kurt Fentress right. here in town who came up with this brilliant idea, and as a result of that, Kurt is now building airports all over the world right. yeah. because he's become sort of the yeah. airport yeah. architect yep. who's and most creative. Right and even though there's a lot of controversy about it, he's another kind of local, you know, hero local guy right. that made good. who participated yeah. and made this yeah. a wonderful facility. Steve, let me, going back to the question you asked, <laughs> I had to right. think about it for yeah. a minute. Um, it's two pieces that mean a lot to me personally because yeah. I took so much grief for it. What all the concessions? Yeah. So when I walk right. through there, I, I know that there are minorities and women and people right. doing business at the airport that would have never had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And our numbers are as high or higher than other mm -hmm. cities around That's the right. country, which means a lot of local people. It makes, the, it makes them feel their government's closer to them. Yeah. But in terms of design, it's the openness. It's, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's the open space that, to me, reflects Colorado how open we are. You go through other airports and it seems crowded, it seems right. congested, 
and it's tight and uh, people are bumping into each other. Again, the no moving walkways, you know, I'm kind of right. high on that. Yeah, yeah. But they all seem tight. When you come to it's, DIA, there's an openness about it. And a calm. And there's a, a calm, calm about it. And then you go out and then you look across and see the prairie and you say, I'm in the West. Yeah. You know, we are a place of open spaces. That, uh, that's what I like about it. I like yeah. when I come home, I know that I'm home, right. mm -hmm. and that it's Colorado, right. and it's Denver, and it's not just some utilitarian space right. where my plane right. landed. Right. Some of the airport in America, right. or in right. the world, right. it's, it's unique. Yeah. And the good news mm -hmm. is that now, as I understand it, the new airport director, Kim Day, is saying we have exceeded phase one goals, and we're now building we'll yeah. phase two ahead of schedule. That's it's right, been yeah. so successful that they've had to accelerate the plans for a phase two. So she's busy at work, uh, working on phase two. And of course, building the hotel and the state, the, the train light station, station, the light rail station. Commuter rail station, yeah. There's, there's even gonna be more exciting developments coming to DIA over the next several years. I like the fact that um, when we see the international flights come in and coming through customs yeah. where it says, welcome to Denver, because yeah. that's really when you say Denver International Airport, the more international flights, because as we all know, we've always talked about that's our port. And so when you see Lufthansa and, right. and, and then you see the uh, uh, British Airways right. and the new airline from Asia, that all of that adds to our business community being able to get out and deal with our products, Icelandic Air and all the others. It just builds on the city's local economy. So do you miss your voice on the train? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've only wanted one thing since I've been mayor. Parking space. Yeah. <laughs> Say it a little louder. I'd like Parking space. <laughs> when I go through the airport, I go through security, people say, don't you get special consumer rates? <laughs> no, I go through security. I take off my shoes and my belt like everybody else, you know? No, I don't have a parking space. Hit, hit. <laughs> you don't want special consumer No, I don't want special no. consideration. No. Um, yes. there's, there's about five minutes left, and, and, and Mayor Webb, you touched on uh, the public art. Mayor Penny, you touched on the beauty of the facility. Maybe, maybe that's a place to go. What, it, what is this as a, as a signature, beautiful emblem of Denver? What, it, what is that? Does that does that figure into DIA's identity? Well, I, I, I think the public art piece is not only aesthetic and speaks to the aesthetics of Denver and of Colorado, but again, you know, so many places you go, it's the, the population interests are determined by either economic or uh, social historical pedigree. When you look at the airport in Denver, you can see some of everybody. You, you know, even upstairs on the second floor, that we have a, uh, a, a synagogue, a mosque, and a chapel. Uh, we have artwork that represents our Latino heritage. You know, African American heritage, Irish heritage. I mean, everybody is in the airport. And to me, that's also what makes our state and our city great. And you can see any of those aspects. When you look through DIA, you can find that. And I think it makes it special. The Native American? Native American, you right. All that. So it's, uh, there's, it's, it's, it's functional, it's beautiful, it's, it's a statement. People never forget it. Uh, and they comment on it. And, and the other remarkable thing is, you know, early on, people were complaining about the distance. And I don't hear that complaint anymore. No. Mm -hmm. In fact, people now tell me they can, because of all the new, you know, E-470 and yeah. all the new accesses that have been built, people have now found themselves uh, accommodating and don't think too badly about oh. the distance anymore. So that's, that's kind of gone away, uh, thankfully. Um, and I think when the light rail system is going to be built, that will make it uh, easier. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that today, as we reflect back on those years of struggle, right, right we all went through, yeah. we've got scars all over the place, and, and we can look at, back on it today and, and almost, uh, I wouldn't say laugh about it, but we can be very proud of the uh, extraordinary achievement that so many people and administrations did to, to build this wonderful facility that will be here for generations to come, and, and people in the future are going to say, you know, hopefully that people in the 80s and 90s had the, the foresight just as our right. early, right. you know, just as Mayor right. Stapleton. Had. Sure, when sure. He, he got the same, you know, Stapleton's Folly. Right, and It's right. being built out in the woods and only his friends are getting contracts and all that criticism. He went ahead 
and we went ahead, all of us and, right. and the broader community. It's something we should be very proud of. And frankly, when I travel around the world, the first question they ask is, how did you do it? Right. How did yeah. you do a greenfield site or a brownfield site and build it from scratch? Right. And how did you have the, the courage and the determination? And it took generations of people to get it done. And that's something that is a reflection of the people of this community, yeah. this can-do spirit that we can do. Yeah. I still remember things. the groundbreaking. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, we were out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. All those cars out there. You know, I mean, really. You know, and, and there was downtown, and it was flat. I mean, it's flat, right? And people were talking about the, the train spur, right. and that's what it was. And Sam Skinner was out there with his shovel. Right. <laughs> he said, where are we? <laughs> you know, what are these oil wells out here? <laughs> and I remember the first time I drove out there, and I saw the big hole. Yeah. And I thought, oh, we're really doing this? Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. It's so it's a, it's a great uh, testament to everybody right. here, and, and frankly, uh, lots of other people. When people ask me, uh, how did you all do it? I say, you know, it was thousands and thousands yeah, of people who either campaigned or supported it or had confidence and participated right. in some way, and it really was a community effort. And you know, there's another re result of this that we have to talk about, and that is the way in which we brought together Adams County and Denver, and, right. and Aurora, and others together, I, I think thereafter laid the groundwork for many other metropolitan yeah, fast tracks would never cooperation have that people didn't think possible. With, with we kind of broke, we kind of broke the, yeah. the mold of, yeah. of you, we where can't more, work together. Where you could do yeah. more together. Right. Absolutely. You know, there's a small piece of history yeah. that uh, the cornerstone that was laid, uh, and most people aren't aware of this, the cornerstone that was laid in the airport um, it bears your name, my name, and some others. It was done by the Masons, oh. and it was the first time that the black and white Masons had done anything together in the history of Colorado when they came in to lay that cornerstone, wow. which is another historical okay. piece. Never heard that. Well, we will leave yeah. it to future uh, mayors to explain the conspiracy theory about what is underneath oh, the Oh, airport. that's right. Yeah. Well, we're not going to talk about that because okay. we, we were sworn to silence. We're not that's gonna, exactly We're right. not going to talk about the it, underground. It's also that. similar to what's under the 16th Street Mall. Yes. They're connected. Yeah, yes, they are. So. <laughs> so, yeah. It goes on. <laughs> Those helicopters. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Yeah.